<laughs> welcome to Zorb Zorb Gaming, my name is Lachlan Linton Keen and welcome to our very first painting masterclass here on the channel. Today I'm joined by my wonderful friend and colleague Dan Lieber. Welcome to the channel Dan. Glad to be here, thanks Lachlan. Dan is a wonderful painter and craftsman from his painting commission company, Full Scale Conflict. He's got an incredible backlog of work, both miniatures and terrain. I'll chuck all his links down in the description so you can go and check that out after you've watched this. And today we are painting some Mumakil, some war elephants of Harrod who have died. They have been felled by some probably quite brave Rohan warriors. These are some gorgeous sculpts done by Adam Brucast from Small Scenics who sent them over to us. Uh, one of them is going to go straight into our Pelennor Fields board and the other two are going to be floating elephants that will be dynamic elements so when elephants die in game we can pop in a corpse which should be very fun. Now we're going to be doing some airbrushing today Dan. Yes. Yes now this is a world that is completely foreign to me. I've never held one of these fangdangled things before so for all the viewers at home who are like me and have no idea how this works so what's a general overview of airbrushing? Well, basically we use very thin down paint to atomize through air pressure to apply to a model. What that will actually achieve is a graduation of color pigments so that we can create natural blends, which you would spend quite a considerable time with a traditional hand brush doing through glazes with highlighting and then glazing and highlighting. You can achieve relatively quickly and easily with an airbrush. Yeah, cool. Well, obviously we've got three massive elephants here and we'd love not to take it forever because we have a huge Pelennor Fields board to also paint, so that's going to be really handy. And uh, I guess it, it also gives us an opportunity to explore some some of these really cool techniques for like the elephant skin tone and, and, and the howdah and that sort of thing. So what's our sort of general overview and approach going to be for these guys? Yep, so we're going for uh, trying to go for as much a natural skin tone as possible. So we've given them a good undercoat of a uh, red brown. Yeah, I just used the uh, Tamiya color, uh, yeah, what is it, the red brown TS1. Uh, I also gave them a wash obviously first and then hit them with a semi gloss varnish and then once that was cured, went down for our brown undercoat. Now, why are we working up from brown to get a natural skin tone? Even though an elephant would typically be grey, mm -hmm. we want to create a more natural skin tone. And if you look at like pictures of elephants in the wild, you know, underneath it's usually sort of a you know a, a dark reddish grey. Mm. Obviously, mm. with the capillaries, and that's where blood flow is going. Yeah, cool. Skin changes according to the blood flow, contact with dirt and stuff like that. So what you want to do is create like a natural skin pigmentation and variation. Cool. And airbrushing is extremely good at that. So. I guess one of the great things about. Uh, airbrushing is that because the layers that you're putting on have such a translucency it allows the paint that's underneath to kind of affect the, the layer that you're putting on is that sort of a Ab correct assumption absolutely because of the thin to nature of the paint shot through the airbrush you can create natural translucent translucent blends so because the paint's so thin the undersurface is you know your, your undercoat is very important to the color palette that you want to work with Awesome, so we're working with a scheme of graduated greys then for our skin tone itself? Yes, so once the skin is complete we're going to move on to the howitzer. Again, we're going to try and keep it with the brown, nice muted colours. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now the brown is already you know, established for the wood itself, so we're only going to dry brush a bit of a buff. Cool, awesome, that's just with traditional dry brushing? Traditional bri dry brushing, yep. so again, we'll keep the layers light until mm -hmm. we get to the ends of the wood, yep. where it should be more sun bleached, so therefore it should be more of a, a light colour. Okay, cool. And with the actual uh, the bindings and the ropes itself, we're just going to use uh, a natural wood grain, yep. which gives it that ropey sort of appearance. All right, well that'll tighten up all the kind of timber tones and get that looking really sharp and then we've still got a little bit of this red fabric that's been kind of left behind as the rest of the howdah is thrown off onto the battlefield so we'll hit that with some reds. Definitely, so again we're going to hit it with a nice gory red, gives it that nice dark red. Yeah, beautiful. And then on top of that just avoiding the recesses mm -hmm. we're going to use a bloody red so that'll give you a nice highlight. Yeah, cool. That sort of nice two-tone. Yes. Lovely. Uh, and of course we have a few wounds as well, which should not be neglected while we're talking about red gore. Mm. Uh, the elephant's got a couple of slashes and big chunks out of his leg, uh, so we'll play uh, with some more red in that area as well. Absolutely. So before the actual blending process begins on the skin itself, right after we've actually done our initial sort of colour highlights, mm -hmm. We're going to actually put in some red in the wound areas. Gorgeous. So as the model gets blended using the greys, those areas should still remain reddish or have an irritated skin appearance. Mm, so nice. that once the model is fully complete, wash is finished, uh, a nice matte varnish put over to protect it, 
we can come back over with a clear colour. So like a clear right. red with a little bit of blue in it to give it that gory appearance. Yeah, cool. Because I mean, like uh, the sort of basic, most fundamental level of, you know, you see miniatures covered in gore at the very end, someone just chucks on a bit of red and it just sort of looks like red paint on a model. It doesn't really have that kind of blood that's tied into the skin tones of the model. So kind of working that through the process, is that part of what helps tie it in to make it look like real gore? Yeah, so the more attention you apply to something early on, will pay dividends much later on at the final stage. Yeah, cool. That's such an important fundamental principle. And then the very last thing, of course, will be our tusks. Yes. Which are always really cool. I love the kind of woman kill tusks you see on the Games Workshop paint jobs where they do that graduated bone and brown coming from, you know, out of the actual tusk joint itself. Yeah, it's kind of like teeth. You yeah, know, yeah. Right, right up at the base, it's going to be a darker colour because that's where your blood flow mm. is. And then as it grows out, it goes white. Cool. So same deal. We're going to actually do like a three colour graduation on the tusk itself, so sort of like an ivory brown mm -hmm. in the midsection down to a nice sort of white. Yeah, cool, that the actual, bony white kind that of bony color. white mm -hmm. at the end, and we'll probably do a nice light brown up toward the actual mouth. Yeah, into almost mantle. the gums in yeah. a way, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Then once all the colors are laid down, we're going to actually put down a gloss varnish. Cool, over the whole model? Over the whole model. Yeah. And then we're going to give it a uh, an enamel wash with um, probably a grey brown. Cool, okay. And what that will do is help to bring out all the deep uh, recessed detail that the airbrush will otherwise uh, basically coat. As yeah, because I guess it's, it's sort of similar to like a rattle can, right? It will just create a sort of even coverage, which is great for blending tones, but yes. it can sort of obscure recessed detail. So um, the enamel washers kind of really bring that detail out? Yes. Cool. So okay. you can re-establish those lower details using a enamel and oil wash. Yeah, cool. And the importance of the gloss, of kind of applying that gloss varnish layer before doing that, is that to help kind of flow the, the fluid? Yeah, absolutely. So you want to have a capillary action with the wash itself. So a gloss will actually smooth the surface, allowing the wash to flow naturally through cool. any of the, you know, the lower lie detail and cracks and crevices and stuff like that. Fantastic. Well, wow, there's a lot to think about. This is going to look pretty awesome. I'm really excited. Uh, I'm going to get out of your way, Dan, and let you start cracking on with those first skin tones and go and operate our close-up camera so we've got some good action. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Let's get into it. Sweet as. So you don't have to shake every day. Done. Alright, so the first thing we're going to do is use light grey. We're going to thin it down probably a 2 to 5 ratio of paint to thinner so that we can start building up the blends. We want the darker areas kept darker but the higher crown areas nice and light so that the whole blending process fits together well. Uh, you want to, This is the slowest part of the whole thing so we want to take our time with it and we don't want to just shoot it in one big hit because it'll ruin the effect. So the first thing we're going to do is create very light blending from the brown up to a grey. So we want to start the graduation so that when we start doing all our layering, it will basically blend together really nicely. So using the light grey from Vallejo Model Air, it was thinned down a fraction to keep it nice and thin so that we can do very short, thin bursts so that we can start the actual blending process. So as you can see, a very thin layer is going down first. And a lot of the brown is still showing up, which is perfect for what we're trying to do. And what we do is use higher points. We just work the color up a bit more so that it starts getting more opaque. The wound, we're just going to build up a little bit of the grey so that when we start applying a little bit of red in there a bit later, it'll show up much nicer. You want reasonably slow passes so that each layer you apply dries so that you don't build up too large of a wet layer. first actual layer finished. 
So with the first layers down to start establishing the blends, uh, we're going to actually add the red to the wound areas. Probably put some into the ear just to give it a bit of a, you know, life to that as well. And there are little, uh, looks like uh, casting holes. So we use those to our benefit and probably put a bit of red into those as well. So they look like uh, puncture wounds from our arrows and stuff like that. So you want to move fairly slow so that the layers dry before the next layer goes down. Otherwise you'll have an explosion of wet paint that will spider out. Now with the red established in the areas that we want it, we're going to move on to the first blend of dark blue grey, thin down to one part paint to ten parts thinner. So as you can see, the ultra thin paint is just enough to start tinting the lower grey colour that we've placed, and you can always add another layer on top of that. If you feel that that first one hasn't tinted correctly, you can go back over it again and add a little bit more. Now that we've got the first blend of the dark blue grey down, we're going to hit points of interest and start highlighting up with ocean grey. So we're trying to pick out all the raised sections and trying to start building up the layers. Slowly build up your layers so that if you want it a little bit brighter up here, come back to that once it's dry and give it another pass. So we've got a few raised sections right here, so we're going to hit that. Slow control burst. Just highlight that up. And same deal up here where the, the ribs are a little higher. Blend that red just a little more in and then under the stomach here. So that gives you some nice contrast along that line between the two lighter colors and the nice darker color in the center. Now that we've started hitting our points of interest with the ocean grey, we want to start accentuating those points with the pale blue grey, which is our final coat. And we'll try and go for a bit of a striped appearance. Following the grooves of the skin. So it gives it the impression that muscle is under there. Now that we've finished all our basic blend layers, we're going to do a light dry brush of Stonewall Grey just to pick the highest points out before the wash begins. Dry brushing on anything that's rather industrial or organic, in my opinion, it's probably one of the better techniques for it. Rather than just, you know, slopping it on everything. Control is key to this. So we don't want to dry brush the whole thing. All we're after is again, the very highest points of the model. To try and help that detail pop a bit. So we've finished the skin tone for the Mumakil and we're going to begin work on the Howitzer. Uh, the colour we're going to use is Vallejo's natural wood grain to get that natural sort of rope look out of it. So with the harnesses we can actually draw the airbrush closer to the work. That will allow us to not get too much overspray on all the skin that we've just done. 
you can also, if you have enough time, put down a gloss varnish on all the skin that you've done. Let it cure so that when you continue with the airbrush work, any overspray can easily be cleaned up from uh, that actual surface with a bit of acrylic thinner. It'll just wipe clean off and all that hard work you put in before won't be ruined. But we're taking a gamble today. So we'll just move the airbrush in a bit closer. Same deal, it's gonna be thin layers. And because we're going to a moderately light color over on already dark color, it will just take a little bit more. Patience is virtue. But as you can see, with each pass, the color is getting better. Okay, so now we've done the natural wood grain for the harness of the howitzer. We're going to now do the landing of the howitzer, starting with a mahogany from Vallejo Air. And we're going to actually just give it a light highlight over the top of that with Vallejo's German camo medium brown. So we're going to bring it in a bit close to the model so that we get less overspray. It's not a very obvious highlight, but once the wash goes down, it will become more apparent and it will complement it just that little bit. So now that the landing on the howitzer has been complete, we're going to do the actual cloth, which is that nice red color starting with a gory red as the undercoat and then we're going to use bloody red to give it that nice red highlight. So now we're using the gory red to start the actual cloth around the howitzer. Just a nice coat. The actual bloody red will be the good highlight so we don't have to worry about blending so to speak on this one. Just short controlled bursts, fairly close to the model. So a little overspray with the actual glory red on top of an already, you know, the howder being a sort of a, a red leather. It won't matter too much. The enamel wash will hide most of our crimes. So now we're doing the bloody red highlight on the howder curtain. Just focusing on all the highlight areas. The highest points, I should say. Now that we've got those colours down on the howitzer, we're going to focus on the wood itself using the Vallejo buff and we're going to dry brush that in graduation so that it starts out fairly dark on the inside and then as it goes up to the end of the wood, nice and light. It's focusing a lot more on the top where the wood would be more bleached than the wood that would still be underneath all the fabric of the howitzer. The last thing we need to do is the tusks. So we're going to actually start with a light brown from the Vallejo range on the entirety of the tusk. We're then going to do a 50-50 mix of off-white and light brown as a mid-tone toward the end. And then we're going to use the off-white on its own right at the end to create a nice white tip. And then we're going to use a little beastie brown right up toward the gum of the tusk so that it has that darker hue and it should graduate nicely from a dark to a light colour. 
So we're getting close to the tusk as well because we want to limit overspray. So thanks to that nice brown undercoat, we're getting a very smooth transition. So now we're doing the 50-50 mix of the off-white and the light brown. So we're going to focus toward middle end of each tusk. Each tusk. Like so. So we just want to blend and then fade up to about there. The more you add to it, obviously, you know, the better the colour. So start thin up top. Nice ivory white down the bottom. All right, so now we're just gonna do the very tips with the off-white itself. So the very last thing we got is that beastie brown just up around the gums. Alright, so all our layering and blending is now finished. We've got the majority of our paint on our tusks and our root work, the howdah and the skin as well. These are looking really great, Dan. They're coming along very nicely. Where do we go from here? Alright, so next we have to put down a gloss varnish. So that'll allow us to do our capillary action with our washes mm -hmm. so that it will flow into all the nooks and crannies and the deep recess details. That yeah, so the, the whole point of these washes is to kind of create the shade and the kind of light and shade in the model? Yes, definitely. So it's the same as an acrylic wash in that regard where we're trying to make shadows and shades and the recess details come out. Mm -hmm. Because with the airbrush it just goes over the whole thing and it gives it an even coat. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah, it's sort of like almost a rattle can really. It's pretty just much. quite even so the wash allows the kind of those details that get a bit flattened out to really kind of sing. Now you said we're, we're going to be using an enamel washes. Yes. Um, I've always Obviously, uh, got a lot of experience with acrylic washes, you know, our, our games workshop range stuff and also the kind of crafty terrain stuff as well. Uh, but enamel washes I haven't used, what's the kind of difference? Why would we choose one over the other? So enamels and oils comes down to your workability and the time frame you can. So you can manipulate them quite a fair bit compared to an acrylic. Yeah, they dry quite quickly. They dry yeah. very quickly, especially mm. here in, you know, the yes. great southern land. Yes, indeed. <laughs> it's like so, 37 outside today, FYI. It's, pretty, uh, it's nice, <laughs> but it's going to get hotter. Yes. Okay, cool. So it, it gives us a longer working time and, and more flexibility to be able to kind of clean up and, and pull washes off parts we don't want. Absolutely. Like sort of business. It allows you to do things like rust streaks and runs. It allows you to tint and create <clears throat> grime effects mm. and stuff like that. Yeah, lovely. Lots of weathering and and because these are organic substances, you know, the shade's really important. Yes. Um, and, you know, kind of get that really nice skin tone. Good shading is is one of the most vital steps. And so before we get into that inking, though, of course, uh, the gloss goes down, and that's to help the, the shade flow. Absolutely. So it'll protect all the work we've done with the airbrush and the hand brushing that we have done, the dry brushing. So you don't want to dis you know destroy all that hard work by putting you know, a wash over it and it not working out. So putting down a gloss varnish will protect all your hard work. So if you do make a mistake or you're gonna use a wash that's gonna to have to be you know, cleaned up later. Yeah, you can just easily pull you it back. You can easily pull it back and you won't damage all that work that you've done before. Fantastic, awesome. Well, let's go and smash these with a bunch of varnish and then we can jump on into putting on some cool shading. Mm. All right, so we've applied a nice even coat of gloss over all the models. That preps them for our enamel washing. It's important that we give the varnishes appropriate amount of time to fully cure so that they don't reactivate while we're applying our washes. The actual gloss itself is best to give it a few hours so it fully cures. And with the enamels, the thinner it is, the quicker they will cure also, but you still want to give them at least an hour before you start to clean them up and another hour after that for them to cure enough for the matte varnish to go on top. So this is now the enamel wash, and it's going over everything, like so.
as you can see, the Mumakil are absolutely filthy with the enamel paint. Now this isn't a typical pin wash, we are doing like an overall wash with the enamel because there's a lot to cover and we want to get all that recessed detail. Pin washing is precise and time consuming, this is just lazy and fast. But don't be concerned with the overall look now because once it's cured we can come back with a cotton swab and some enamel thinner and we can lift it all off the raised areas and leave the enamel in the recessed areas where we want it. So we can bring back all that colour we previously had. So we've hit the three elephants with a matte varnish and they are now finished looking absolutely fantastic. Well done, Dan. You're welcome. Um, what are we looking at now in terms of uh, time? Look, about six hours? Definitely within six hours. Yeah, that's pretty pretty admirable. They look absolutely fantastic for big three elephants. But of course, that's not including our total sort of waiting time for drying. And that's no. It is. The downside to using this kind of technique with the varnishes and enamels is the actual uh, drying time with those materials. Yeah, cool. I guess it hasn't been such a huge kind of bother for us because we've been working essentially over two days between these elephants and the Pelinor field, which you guys will have seen or will see in other videos. And uh, and so, you know, you just got to sort of uh, put it to the side and, and let it happen and not rush it because that's one of the important things, isn't it? If you work with tacky paint. You will ruin it. You have to give things the, it's due time. Mm, you really yeah. do. That patience is almost a skill in and of itself. It is. Uh, a big kind of learning curve for me was the uh, the way that we could use varnishes and, and I guess early in the middle and at the end of process. I've only ever kind of thought of matte varnishing stuff at the end as a, as a protective layer, yeah. but bringing those varnishes into the painting process was kind of my probably biggest learning takeaway and being able to use them protect almost like you would do a sub-assembly with a miniature. It's like it's you know a sub-assembly within the painting scheme. Put a varnish down just to work over the top. Most definitely. That is a uh, skill set that a lot of scale modelers use in order to get those ridiculously realistic appearances out of their mold kits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all those kind of like rust and weathering effects the, and, and that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, definitely. All those blendings and mm. you know all that craziness that, that can fit into those whoa, really awesome kits. Yeah, I suppose we kind of used that again at the end because we came back in after the final matte varnish and applied a little bit of our red to the wounds. Yeah, so we used a little clear red with a bit of blue in it just to darken it down to give those, you know, wounds some real uh, life to them. Yeah, cool. Whereas the matte varnish, you know, it softened everything and makes everything blend together and then having that clear put into the wound actually makes it look Realistic, yeah, nice like, and wet. Like a bit of moisture, essentially. Yeah. And and because we already put, we, I say we, because Dan already put those uh, beautiful colours into the skin tone, they look really, really realistic, which is pretty awesome. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Dan. It's been a pleasure having you here on Zorbazor. Thank you, Lockie. We hope to have you back. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you have, give us a like and let us know down in the comments any other things you'd like to see Dan come back for. Maybe some fell beasts or some trolls. We could keep our little creature series going and do a couple of cool vanilla things. Would you come back, Dan? I love painting monsters. I won't say no. Yes, of course he does. He's a big monster mash. Be sure to check out all of Dan's work over at Full Scale Conflict. We will throw a link down in the description for that and you can see his myriad of wonderful paintings and terrainings and all of the gorgeous stuff. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope you're enjoying everything we're doing here on the channel. Subscribe if you're new around here and if you haven't already, jump over to our Patreon down in the description below and check out all of that goodness you can come and join our buzzing little community on the discord and check out all of the photos we upload as we're working and all of the shenanigans that are happening over there but in the meantime keep on sbg gaming guys we'll see you next time